podcast comes to you from the University of Toronto, Mississauga. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to work on this land, and we strive toward peace and reconciliation among all peoples. Hi, I'm Jill Kasky, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Welcome to Medieval Art Matters, a podcast where we showcase the vitality of contemporary research on the Middle Ages. In each episode, we invite a scholar to talk about a critical issue that shaped the experiences of people living centuries ago and that still matters today. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Linda Safran, for a discussion of today's theme, Muhammad in Islamic art. Hello, I'm Linda Safran of the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in Toronto. Our guest today is Christiane Gruber, who is Professor of Islamic Art at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Her main fields of research are medieval and post-medieval Islamic book arts and material culture. She has written several books, including The Praiseworthy One, the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic Texts and Images, and two volumes that explore depictions of Muhammad's ascension to heaven. Professor Gruber is also the founding director of Kamsin, Islamic Art History Online, which is a very rich open access platform of digital resources for the study of Islamic art and architecture. Welcome, Professor Gruber, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you so much for inviting me. We're looking at an image of Muhammad on the podcast page of artofthemiddleages.com. Can you tell us some basics about this image, when it was made, where it comes from? With pleasure. This is a painting that is included in an illustrated manuscript produced in what is now Iran or Persian lands in 1570. So it's an early modern Persian manuscript painting. This particular image occurs in the preliminary section of a book that is entitled Yusuf and Zuleha, and that is about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, written by the Persian spiritual poet by the name of Jami. The section here is a prolegomenon, or an introductory section in praise of God, the Prophet, and in particular, the Prophet Muhammad's celestial ascension. Uh, the episode that follows the text describes Muhammad coming into union with God. You will notice Muhammad as a figural depiction, a man in the flesh wearing a green robe, but his face is covered with a white facial veil, so his facial features are not visible. His entire body, which is genuflecting, emits a large blazing aureole, and he's genuflecting towards a big bundle of flames, and that is most likely a metaphorical depiction of God. And what I find really beautiful about this image is that both of these entities, the prophet as veiled corporeal entity emitting light as he comes into communion with the Godhead, is that they are surrounded as if a duet, but in union by a cordon of flames all around which creates an orbicular kind of scene that focuses the eye on this intense moment of dialogue between the two. Despite the flames, despite the extraordinary nature of beholding God and his flame-like manifestation, Muhammad's hands are very calmly placed on his knees or thighs, and he looks very much at peace. Is there an intended audience here? Is this a kind of contemplative image that is meant to be emulated by the viewer? Yes, he looks like he's actually in genuflection, which is part of the prayer ritual in Islam. There are several gestures of prayer. Prayer is actually locomotive in Islam, congregational prayer. You start in the standing position, and then slowly but surely you go down into genuflection. And then during prayer, you'll often see the prayer sitting like this uh, on their knees. So this represents more or less one of the three potential prayers that take the devotees from upright down and then kneeling. So 
in a way, the form fits function here. It's intended to convey devotional prayers. At the same time, this is quite an elite product. It's very expensive to create an illuminated manuscript. Lapis lazuli, this very deep blue, is as expensive as gold. So the two most expensive pigments are used in this case. So these kinds of images had very restricted audiences. They were not out in the public sphere. They could be passed around in a group during a reading event where these Persian poetic verses would be read aloud and the image would be shown. And these individuals who are quite elite would be conversant, not just in Persian Sufi poetry, which is what you see here in the text, but also in Islamic doctrinal debates and theology. And of course, one of the big debates in Islam is what is the nature and the modality of God? How does one describe the extensive nature of God's presence but absence, trying to represent uh, a divine figure without resorting to crude anthropomorphisms? So the painting adds to those discussions with its own visual lexicon. So this is an early modern image. Did such images exist in previous centuries in the Middle Ages? And were they always in the manuscript medium? The earliest images that we have of the Prophet Muhammad date to the 13th century. So we have a big gap. And the earliest images of Muhammad where he has a flaming oriole and he's connected to God in this fashion, those images don't represent God as a flaming bundle. So this here is very unusual, which is why I picked it for discussion. There aren't that many before this 1570 painting that actually engage in the bundle motif, although Muhammad is represented with uh, flaming light. This was a very widespread concept that God created something known as a light of Muhammad. It's called Nur Muhammad in Arabic. And that this creative substance was then sent into the world to create all worldly matter, all earthly matter, before the corporeal appearance of the Prophet Muhammad later on. The closest we get to this kind of visualization of God as light or light upon light is in the Quran. There is a verse called the verse of light. God is described as nur ala nur or light upon light. At times in Qurans, uh, you'll notice that the script is either in a black or brown ink, but anytime the name Allah is written, it's in gold ink. So God shines bright through his scripted name within Quranic context as well. Are there objections to images of Muhammad earlier in the medieval Islamic world? There are no stated objections to images of Muhammad until the Yulin's Poston cartoon controversy of 2005. This is when really images of Muhammad burst forth in the public sphere. However, anxieties about figural representations have been a staple of Islamic cultures, just as they have for Christian and Jewish cultures. Those waves of anxieties have waxed and waned uh, through the centuries. So if you take a look at the text, and in particular, the collections of the Prophet Muhammad's statements, his sayings, known as the Hadith, you'll notice statements that dare artists to breathe life into their creations. But in other hadiths, you'll find that Muhammad keeps a pillow with figural imagery in his house and does not have a problem with such imagery as long as it doesn't intersect with him facing the Kaaba during his prayers. And that kind of mixed emotion around images has stayed pretty steady through the centuries. So the problem with an image is that the viewer might start worshipping the image rather than that which it represents. And in Islam, that's also tied with an anxiety about worshipping the dead. And that's why you also see legal opinions issued that ban the construction of shrines and mausolea, lest the visitors start worshipping the deceased rather than God. But the ironic thing with that is that shrines and mausolea are the number one type of architecture that is spread across the Islamic world. In the Middle Ages and today, does the Sunni or Shi context have an impact on approvals or objections? You'll often hear that it's much more frequent to find images, including images of Muhammad in Shi cultural contexts, and that is true for today. You'll find many more images of the Prophet in contemporary Iran than elsewhere. And in fact, one of the reactions in Iran to the Yulin's posting cartoon controversies 
was to create a five-story mural of the Prophet Muhammad on a public building as a reaction. So that's a reaction that's very different from the issuing of legal opinions that ban such images, which you find largely in, in Salafi and Wahhabi spheres in Saudi Arabia. And we tend then to think that the Sunnis are more adverse to such images because we tend to associate Sunnism with Saudi Arabia. So we have to be really careful not to extract from that a sectarian position that has withstood the test of time. So I would say a, a more accurate way of describing the phenomenon would be that images of Muhammad are simply more widespread in the Turco-Persian world as opposed to the Arab world. And over centuries, it didn't necessarily fall along sectarian lines, although it is increasingly the case nowadays. Are other Quranic prophets depicted with any restrictions in Islamic art? Yes, absolutely. The prophet Moses is also depicted because the prophet Moses is also aligned to a burning bush. He's uh, shown with flames around his face. And at times he's also shown with a facial veil, just like the prophet Muhammad. Jesus is also frequently shown. There are no depictions of the crucifixion, however, because in Islam, this is not a component of Christ's life that's believed to have occurred. There are plenty of images of Joseph in this very same manuscript. And like the prophet Muhammad, he's shown veiled, exuding flames of light. And oftentimes light and the veil are used specifically in the poetry which accompanies these verses to describe the luminescent and veiled mystery of the sacred beautiful. These prophets, Joseph uh, and Muhammad in this case, are simply too beautiful to behold. You might burn up if you were to have access to their full corporeality. Therefore, they're secreted behind this veil of mystery, and yet they're lambent and numinous in their own sort of hierophonic ways. If other prophets in this manuscript are depicted in a similar way, are there other ways in which there is a hierarchy or differentiation among them in which Muhammad really stands out as the prophet? Yeah, there are a couple ways that you can recognize the prophet in contradistinction to others who might also have a flaming aureole and a facial veil. Oftentimes, if the pigment has flecked off the facial veil, you'll see that instead of facial features below that pigment, you'll have an invocation in script that reads, Ya Muhammad. So the artist is invoking the prophet through a scripted prayer. You'll see the scripted invocation to Muhammad below and above the veil. Oftentimes the prophet is also distinguished by his green robe. He's often the only prophet with a green robe. And last but not least, although this is not the case in this particular painting, you can tell the prophet apart by very long flowing braids. Either he'll have two on the front or he'll have four, two on the front, two on the back. And the texts also tell us that when Muhammad made his turban, that he would leave the end piece of the fabric to flutter out. So if you look very closely at this turban, you'll see the end of that long white fabric just flittering out at the top. And he was also in the habit of taking that turban fabric and wrapping it around his neck and letting it hang over his shoulders. That was his particular way of wrapping the turban. What kind of objections are there today to representations of Muhammad and how do artists working in different media deal with them? It's a very tricky landscape today uh, because we're in a post-cartoon world twice over. First, the Yulin's post in cartoons of 2005 and, of course, Charlie Hebdo in 2015. And that has really shifted the possibilities for artists because anxieties are quite high because of those two global events. And so artists are operating in a narrowed field of production simply for fear of potentially being called heretics and suffering the consequences of that accusation. Artists in Iran and other areas of the world are still producing devotional images of the Prophet Muhammad more and more, you won't see his facial features. Those are metaphorized in a variety of ways. One objection is that you can't depict the prophet because he's too beautiful. He transcends all efforts of rendering him through corporeal means. So it's an anti-corporeal stance for, yes, a human being who is only human, but he did come in contact with the divine essence. So that's one objection. Showing the Prophet Muhammad through any kind of corporealism would be a demotion of his prophetic status, and it would not capture his transcendental beauty. 
Another objection that you see is that any kind of representation would involve a process of non-respect. This you see in the fatwas, in some of the legal opinions, and they tether these historical images of the Prophet Muhammad very closely to cartoons. And so there's an alignment of the historical materials with images that have been incredibly disgraceful and images that have been purposefully disrespectful. The third, and I think the most important issue, is that the objections are raised by either side, Muslims and non-Muslims, to drive home an ideological binary in which actors have at stake the differential quality of Islam in order to make it incommensurate with Judeo-Christian cultures. What better way to say that Islam is utterly different from Christianity than to stress certain characters that make it utterly alien or incomprehensible? And the so-called ban on images of Muhammad, which does not exist, would be one such strategy to keep up that false dichotomy because actors have that dichotomy at stake. In some of my previous writing, I've mentioned that you have the Salafi component, so the Unitarian, rather conservative aspect of Islam that stresses that these images shouldn't exist. And you also have the sort of Orientalist scholarship and even the alt-right saying that these images don't exist because Islam is so different. And I refer to that as the Salafi Orientalist echo chamber because Those two interlocutors need each other to reinforce a false dichotomy. And so the trick is to find that very messy nexus of contestation, the tertiary space where historical evidence actually exists without being pulled in one direction or another. It's fascinating, too, to think of how that anxiety or those two echo chambers that you mentioned could really benefit from understanding the anxieties about image making in Judaism and Christianity, which somehow get left out of these binary narratives. These medieval and early modern images have lessons to teach us today. Absolutely. Professor Gruber, where do you see the field of Islamic art history going and where would you like it to go? I'm very hopeful uh, for the field of Islamic art. It's come onto its own. It's really lively and dynamic. We have plenty of young scholars now who are specialists of modern and contemporary art. Traditionally, that was not a field of scholarly inquiry. I'm very excited to see junior scholars up and rising who are focusing on new topics that happen to fall beyond 1800. And I think that's very important because Islam has been couched as a perennially medieval tradition, as have its artworks. But at the same time, I'm also very much looking forward to the younger scholars looking at what has been considered the canon. We have some brilliant scholars who are looking at early Islamic art and medieval architecture because those still remain to be carefully studied. To my mind, it's very important to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and to always be able to look at the whole gamut of materials, whether you're talking about art or visual culture or material culture. I'm also interested to see how some scholars are taking up some of the newest turns. There have been many turns, the visual turn, uh, the sensorial turn, right, the effective turn. And nowadays, Islamic art historians are taking the environmental turn. They're looking more and more at the post-humanities and animal studies, ecology, and the insights that they might glean from, say, the post-humanities, where you integrate the human with animals and the earth, will uh, yield some results, I think, that will be illuminating for even the earliest of Islamic traditions. So if you really want to think about the earth, you might have to go back and explain the Kaaba much more thoughtfully through the lens of the fact that it is a reliquary for a black stone. Or you might have to go back to the Dome of the Rock and re-explain that structure in light of the fact that it is the Dome of the Rock. It, it is a shelter for a rock. So all of these insights, I think, will force us to go back and think critically on received paradigms and narratives, all the while as it will propel the field forward as it continues to integrate not only the field of art history, but the humanities. And from my perspective, the story of the images of the Prophet Muhammad is only at its beginning. And I'm looking forward to see what other scholars will do in the future, because there's still much to be done. Thank you, Professor Gruber, for coming to speak with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure chatting with both of you.
That was Professor Christian Gruber of the University of Michigan on Muhammad in Islamic Art. You've been listening to an episode of Medieval Art Matters, hosted by Linda Safran and me, Jill Kasky. Medieval Art Matters complements the book written by Jill Kasky, Adam Cohen, and Linda Safran, called Art and Architecture of the Middle Ages, Exploring a Connected World. It is published by Cornell University Press. For more information, go to the website that accompanies the book, artofthemiddleages.com, where you'll also find more podcasts in this series. Medieval Art Matters is made possible by the support of the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto, St. George Campus, and the Office of the Vice Principal and Dean, University of Toronto, Mississauga. Many thanks to the Toronto Consort for providing the music. This podcast was brought to you by Cited Media Productions. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to a Cited Media production. C I D E D. Find out more at SidedMedia.ca.